The following is a CNN special report. The shocking crime. Ron and Nicole were butchered. The riveting car chase. 911, what are you reporting? This is AC. I have OJ in the car. Now, OJ Simpson on trial for murder. Stop domestic violence! This was the perfect soap opera. The characters like Cato Kalin. So it seems like you feel like you were pretty much misunderstood for a really long time. 100% misunderstood. The moments and mistakes. It was like a slow motion disaster movie for the prosecution. Two decades later. It makes no sense. It doesn't fit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. The OJ trial, drama of the century. It's minutes after midnight, June 13th, 1994. Los Angeles police arrived to a crime scene at Bundy Drive in upscale Brentwood. They find no witnesses, no murder weapon, just two victims. Slash, stabbed, everything else. Nicole was nearly decapitated. It was a very bloody scene. Nicole is Nicole Brown Simpson. Lying dead beside her, 25-year-old Ron Goldman. The prime suspect, Nicole's ex-husband, football legend, O.J. Simpson. Simpson promises to surrender and then disappears. The Los Angeles Police Department right now is actively searching for Mr. Simpson. Simpson is soon spotted inside a white SUV. Highway Patrol. Yeah, um, I think I just saw OJ Simpson on the uh, 5 freeway and he's heading north. The famous low speed chase, covered live for hours, rivets the nation and ends with Simpson's eventual surrender at his home on Rockingham Avenue. It was just the beginning. Go, 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 go. Here's what we know right now, Lieutenant Duncan. This was the perfect soap opera. House. The O.J. Simpson murder case was the first true reality show for the country. OK, let's go. Here we go. This was the first wall-to-wall -wall televised trial. July 22, 1994, a month after the murders, the legal proceedings against O.J. Simpson begin when he enters this defiant plea. Absolutely 100% not guilty. And to help him prove that, Simpson assembles a legal dream team. Each one of them was famous. Jeffrey Tubin covered the trial for The New Yorker. There has never been in American history more prominent defense lawyers on a single trial than in the O.J. Simpson case. There's Harvard law professor Alan Dershowitz. An ideal intermediary between the ivory tower and the gritty world of trial practice. Famed criminal attorney F. Lee Bailey. The person you go to when you are really in a lot of trouble and can afford it. And of course, Johnny Cochran, who would take the lead. Flamboyant, outgoing, approachable, fun, and extremely charismatic, while also having considerable mastery of the details of the case. And known for defending celebrities like child actor Todd Bridges, football legend Jim Brown, and superstar Michael Jackson. But would the all-star strategy work? The O.J. Gene team was not a dream team. It was a nightmare team. Um, most of the lawyers didn't get along with each other. There was a lot of competition for the limelight. But despite all that competition, Simpson's team comes up with this. They allege that LAPD detective Mark Furman was a racist who planted evidence. 
This is not just any city where an allegation of a racist cop is being made. This is the LAPD. The racist allegations simmering under the surface come to a boil just days before the trial begins, when the defense wants permission to ask Furman if he's ever used the N-word. And I'll use the word because it's, I'm quoting him, all the niggers put them together in a big group and burn them. But prosecutor Chris Darden wants no part of it. It is the filthiest, dirtiest, nastiest word in the English language. It will upset the black jurors. It'll issue a test, it'll give them a test, and the test will be whose side are you on? The side of the white prosecutors and the white policemen? Or are you on the side of the black defendant and his very prominent and capable black lawyer? And so I want Cochran I immediately to fires back. Not every African American feels that way. It's demeaning to our jurors to say that African Americans cannot hear these offensive words. You don't go back in time. The battle lines are drawn, and race will help define the trial's outcome. It's January 24th, 1995. The trial of Orenthal James Simpson has begun. There was a forest of satellite trucks, satellite dishes, people working in trailers, all built so that this trial could go out to the world. Walking into the courtroom every day, it was like the red carpet on an arrivals line or at the Oscars. How are you feeling today, OG? You know, it's a, you know, it's a, uh, Marsha, how you doing? Uh, but, you know, how are your kids? What are you wearing? It's ridiculous. It was crazy. Outside the courthouse, it's a circus. Inside, a real-life drama unfolding with millions of people watching. The Simpson case combined everything that obsesses the American public. It had violence, sex, race, sports, and the only eyewitness was a dog. The prosecution's opening statement tells a story of love, lust, and loss of control. He killed her because he couldn't have her. That trail of blood from Bundy through his own Ford Bronco and into his house in Rockingham is devastating proof of his guilt. What those records show. Johnny Cochran's opening statement tells jurors a very different story. The evidence will show that this the careless, slipshod, negligent collection, handling, and processing of samples by basically poorly trained personnel from LAPD has contaminated, compromised, and corrupted the DNA evidence in this case. Coming up, behind the scenes. It's the first time I've ever really seen a Heisman Trophy. And in court with a juror. So did you ever believe Cato Kalin's testimony at all? This is how we knew O.J. Simpson, football star, celebrity pitch man. Nobody does it better than her. and movie star. But prosecutors say that dashing public persona hides a much darker truth that Simpson is a violent man who beat his wife. Please be seated. And it didn't take long before a police detective testifies about an incident in 1989. A woman came running out of the bushes to my left across the uh, driveway she was a uh, female caucasian blonde hair she was wearing uh, a bra only as a upper garment and she had on uh, dark lightweight sweatpants and started yelling he's going to kill me he's going to kill me then jurors hear it for themselves another chilling 911 call from simpson's wife in 1993 my husband just broke into my house and he's ranting and raving. Less than a year before her murder. 
We broke the back door down to get in. Before. Okay, wait a minute. What's your name? Nicole Simpson. Okay, is he the sportscaster or whatever? Yeah. What is he doing? Is he threatening you? <laughs> going nuts. And I was like, wow, he can be pretty bad. Now, 20 years later, juror number four, David Aldana, remembers that moment vividly. So that 911 tape made an impact. Yeah, it did, because when you hear somebody pounding on the door like that and hearing Nicole say, I think you know his record by now. Nicole's sister, Denise, tells prosecutors she has seen Simpson beat Nicole in person. He grabbed Nicole, told her to get out of his house, wanted us all out of his house, picked her up, threw her against a wall, picked her up, threw her out of the house. However, defense attorney Robert Shapiro counters with a completely different image of O.J. Simpson. Here he is with the Brown family just hours before Nicole's murder. We played for the jury the June 12th videotape where you saw O.J. Simpson at 6, 6.30 in the evening of June 12th. And you saw him. He was kissing the Brown family. He was shaking hands with Lou Brown. He picked his son up. He didn't look like a man who was dour and bitter and raging. So is Simpson a warm family man or a violent attacker who cornered and killed two innocent people? The jurors and Simpson take a field trip to his house and the crime scene. It was very, very good for the jury, I think, to be able to see the relationship of each of those locations to each other, as well as to get a much clearer idea of how very, very small the space was in which Ron Goldman was attacked and murdered by the defendant. And so I think that this really assisted the jury in being able to understand the evidence better, the testimony better, and how the victims were essentially cornered. What do you remember the most about visiting O.J.'s house, actually going to the crime scene? And I was like, oh, wow, that's the first time I've ever really seen a Heisman Trophy. We couldn't ask questions. Nothing was told to us. Don't talk amongst yourselves and don't, uh, don't touch anything. And it's this home visit that leads to the very heart of the prosecution's case, the physical evidence against O.J. Simpson. Can you please describe uh, the appearance of the glove, sir? It appeared a uh, dark leather glove. It appeared to be somewhat moist or sticky. I didn't touch it, but it, it appeared that parts were sticking to other parts of the glove. Defense lawyers are eager to point out Detective Mark Furman's role in discovering the evidence. And now uh, Mark Furman came up to you and, and told you he'd made some discoveries. Is that correct? Yes. And so that we're clear, it was Mark Furman who allegedly found uh, this glove out there near Cato Kalen's room. Is that correct? Outside? Yes. And it was Mark Furman who allegedly found this spot on the outside of the Bronco. Is that correct? That's correct. Mark Furman would play a starring role in this unfolding drama, as would this man. I heard a thumping noise. How many thumps did you hear? Three. Simpson's shaggy house guest, Cato Kalin. Did you ever expect what was going to happen when you got up there and took the stand? No, not at all. I had, it was my first time in a courtroom in my entire life. And I think I was 35 at the time. Kalin's four days on the stand thrust him into the national spotlight. I even come up with a thing saying, never has a man done so little to be recognized by so many. Today he testified, he said that O.J.'s maid never really liked him. Oh, sure, she had to work for her room and boy. I'm glad she's not gonna like Why was Cato Kalin so memorable? He's an idiot. Really? Oh, he's so full of shit. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's pretty harsh. Matter of fact, when uh, we were doing um, our deliberations, was, he was like a no-brainer. The guy's an idiot. And nothing he says we can, can't go with or, or against it. He's null and void. And I was called so many things. I was called a celebrity. I was called a pariah. I was called a traitor. I was called a dummy. I was called a freeloader. So it seems like you feel like you were pretty much misunderstood for a really long time. 100% misunderstood. This was something I took so serious that I was making sure that I answered everything correctly. So I was in deep thought going, okay, answer this right, Cato, and 
that was it. If you pause, people go, he's making something, he's, he's lying, he's doing this. Furthest thing from the truth, it's for me to become even more honest, for me to make sure I answer this thing 100% honest. Which brings us to the night of the murder. Kalen and Simpson make a McDonald's run. About what time was it when you got home? It's about 9.40. Kalen goes to his bedroom, and prosecutors say Simpson disappears. A crucial hour passes before Kalen hears a loud noise outside. Okay. And where did that noise seem to be coming from? From the back of the wall. That, prosecutors say, is Simpson hitting an exterior wall and dropping a bloody glove. At 10.55, a limo driver waiting to take Simpson to the airport spots a black person, six feet tall, 200 pounds. I saw a figure come into the uh, entranceway of the house. Alan Park says he'd been buzzing the intercom since 10.40 and received no response, proving, prosecutors say, Simpson had not been home. This time there was an answer, uh, which was Mr. Simpson. He told me that, uh, that he overslept and uh, he just got out of the shower and he'd be down in a minute. Both Park and Kalen notice a dark duffel bag near the rear of Simpson's Bentley. He came out and uh, Cato offered to go get the bag and uh, he said, no, no, that's okay, I'll get it, I'll get it. So what was in the bag? And what did Simpson do with it? Detective Tom Lang has a theory. So you want to know what happened to the knife and the clothes? And we know that from a witness out at the airport, I believe. Saw him getting out of the limousine when he left on American Airlines the night of the murders and had his arm buried in a trash container. Next. With so much evidence, what went wrong? That's people 77. Chris Darden blew it. The team prosecuting O.J. Simpson for murder has no weapons and no witnesses. But what they do have is a wealth of forensic evidence. Evidence that seems to prove O.J. Simpson butchered Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson. This appeared to me to be an overkill or a rage killing. There was blood everywhere. At the Bundy crime scene, at Simpson's Rockingham estate, and scattered along the route in between. Blood, prosecutors say, is Simpson's. Does that mean that these characteristics that Mr. Simpson has that are also found in the Bundy Walk bloodstain are only found in approximately one out of 170 million Caucasians or African Americans? Yes, approximately. And that's not all. Blood consistent with both victims was found in Simpson's Bronco on that glove discovered behind his house and on these socks in his bedroom. You describe that material or that's blood staining as matching Nicole Brown, is that that's right? That's correct. Then there were the bloody shoe prints in the Bronco and on Nicole's dress. FBI expert William Bodziak says those prints came from Bruno Mali designer shoes in Simpson's size, 12. Can you include him as a candidate who could have worn the shoes that created the impressions in this case? Yes, I could include him as a candidate for possibly having worn those shoes. As the trial wears on, attention turns from socks and shoes to gloves. One found at the murder scene, the other behind Simpson's house. Together, Prosecutors believe they have proof that Simpson's caught red-handed. I'm handing Mr. Simpson the uh, that cloth parking in. That's people 77. What were you thinking when you heard Prosecutor Christopher Darden request that Simpson try on those gloves? <laughs> 
I was sitting in the courtroom. I couldn't find a seat, so I was kind of in the back. And when he did that, F. Lee Bailey came up to me and he grabbed me and whispered in my ear. He was kind of laughing. Why the hell did you let him do that? I said, I didn't know he was going to do anything. No, Chris is a good man. He's a good prosecutor. He's a bright man. He should have known better. I remember watching the gloves in the courtroom and thinking to myself, he's not going to ask OJ to put on the glove. That's too much of a risk. You never ask a question in a courtroom, much less do a demonstration where you don't know what the outcome is. And it was like a slow motion disaster movie for the prosecution as OJ milk the moment for all it was worth and pretended to try on those gloves. After the trial, Christopher Darden would admit to Larry King it was a mistake. When it happened in court, did you know you were in trouble? I knew that it hadn't gone as well as I'd hoped it would. It, it, uh, it, it should have gone. Did you re regard it as like earth shattering to the case? No. Not no. necessarily, not particularly. It wasn't until I went upstairs and left the courtroom that I realized that people thought that it was a monu monumental uh, uh, failure, a monumental mistake. Was it Chris Darden that blew this case? Chris Darden blew this case. Marsha Clark contributed pretty heavily to blowing the case, too, but Chris Darden blew it. When O.J. was able to walk in front of the jury and say, it's too small, he didn't have to testify because he had already testified in front of the jury and he wasn't cross-examined. So for us, it was a win-win. All right, he appears to have pulled the gloves on, counsel. But to juror David Aldana, it didn't seem like a big deal. So O.J. Simpson was right in front of you when he put on that glove. He was about maybe two feet away from me. What do you remember from that moment? You know, a lot of people make a big deal about it, but, you know, I was a truck driver. I wear gloves all the time. Um, I know that when my gloves get wet, they shrink up. Yes, I do. After 92 exhausting days of testimony, 58 witnesses, and 488 exhibits, we ask the court to receive all of the people's exhibits and the people rest. Next. The LAPD's laboratory is a cesspool of contamination. That you took the defense unleashes a blistering attack. How about that, Mr. Fung? We think the evidence will show that he did not, could not, and would not commit these particular crimes. Johnny Cochran came roaring out of the gate on the attack and on the offensive. The LAPD's laboratory is a cesspool of contamination. Citing police incompetence. Some had gloves, some didn't have gloves, picking up the evidence. Even suggesting a conspiracy to frame O.J. Simpson. The fact that blood mysteriously appears on vital pieces of evidence is devastating evidence of something far more sinister. But the fireworks really begin here. Defense lawyer Barry Sheck unleashes a relentless barrage of questions on experts like LAPD criminologist Dennis Fung. How about that, Mr. Fung? Confronting him about not wearing gloves while handling evidence. Did you touch that envelope with your bare hands? and inconsistencies in his testimony. So you did begin evidence collection before the coroner's left? Yes. So what you said before wasn't true? It was the best of my recollection at the time. And then the photos from the rear gate of Nicole Brown Simpson's home. This one was taken by Fung 20 days after the murders. As you can see, there's a blood stain. However, a photo taken just hours after the murders showed no blood stain. Where is it, Mr. Fung? Look what they did to uh, Fung. He needed a vacation after that because they just reamed him. I can't see it in the pit photograph. What do you remember the most about 
Fung just getting torn apart by Sheck. Oh, man. Does that refresh your recollection? Is that a concern of yours? Sure that? Barry Sheck is yes. one heck of an attorney. You just ripped them apart. Sheck is trying to convince the jury not only were investigators incompetent, but they tried to frame O.J. for the murders. And juror David Aldana agrees. Do you truly believe that evidence was planted? Yes. I, from this day till the day I die, I, I think it was planted. If this was a conspiracy, how do you get blood on socks, blood on the Bronco, oh, look, his own blood? It's laughable. Okay, let's look at planting of blood, okay? How do we get that blood from Simpson, who's in Chicago, to plant blood that's already at the scene? It made no sense. Obviously, it made no sense. We didn't get Simpson's blood until he returned from Chicago. Then none of it made any sense, but nobody cared. It was a great show. And the show continues. More testimony from defense experts. Have you ever seen a single assailant wear two pairs of shoes? No. That represents human DNA that shouldn't be there, and that's what our definition of contamination is. On the stand now, OJ's personal physician, Robert Heisinga. He testifies that Simpson was in no way physically capable of murdering Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson. Although he looked like Tarzan, you know, he was walking more like Tarzan's uh, grandfather. The defense is on a roll until prosecutor Brian Kelberg plays this 70-minute workout video on cross-examination. Working up a little sweat here, too. You bet. It was filmed just two weeks before the murder. Simpson not only looks fit, but even cracks a joke about wife beating. Yeah, I'm telling you, you got to get your space in if you're working out with the wife, if you know what I mean. But perhaps the most dramatic and powerful moment for the defense is still to come. Once he said, never in 10 years have I ever used the N-word, I knew we had him. It was Mark Furman who allegedly found this spot on the outside of the Bronco. Is that correct? That's correct. At every opportunity. Did Mark Furman have a flashlight when he was over at the Bronco? O.J. Simpson's team attacks lead detective Mark Furman. Did you have occasion to have a conversation with Mark Furman? F. Lee Bailey says Furman isn't credible and may even be criminal. Did you go back to the crime scene? No. Did you do any more observation? Bailey wants to know if he planted evidence at the scene. Did you wipe a glove in the Bronco, Detective Furman? No. You did not? No. But some of the jurors, like David Aldana, believe Furman was up to no good. Did you ever for a moment believe that the police wanted to frame O.J. Simpson? Frame him? I think that was in Furman's mind. But why would Furman want to frame O.J. Simpson? Simple, says the defense team. Furman is a racist. Why did it become so much about race? It's amazing because O.J. Simpson was as white a black person as you can imagine. He lived a white life, lived in a white neighborhood. Married to a white woman. Married to a white woman, uh, working for a major car company. He was not part of the African-American community to speak of, but I think that many African Americans could identify with the police tampering with evidence and planting evidence. Were you familiar with the language attributed to you by Ms. Bell? In and to hammer home that Furman is a racist, Bailey repeatedly asks if he'd used a certain racial slur. And you say on your oath that you have not addressed any black person as a nigger or spoken about black people as niggers in the past 10 years, Detective Furman. That's what I'm saying, sir. So that anyone who comes to this court and quotes you as using that word 
in dealing with African Americans would be a liar, would they not, Detective Furman? Yes, they would. All of them, correct? All of them. I was focused on Mark Furman, his every twitch, his every eye movement, and so forth. I had no notes. I only wanted one thing from him, denial. No. Never. No. Once he said, never in 10 years have I ever used the N-word, I knew we had him. When he was asked that question by F. Lee Bailey by using the N-word, everybody in the world knew that he was being set up but him. What I didn't know was we also had him on tape. Four months after Bailey versus Furman, the defense gets an unlikely tip. Screenwriter Laura Hart McKinney had interviewed Mark Furman for a fictional script she was writing, and she still has the audio recordings. Despite a court order to keep the tape sealed, some of the startling contents are leaked. He's just a real racist scum. Now all we're gonna look at is Furman and what a scumbag he is. Otherwise, and to Ron Goldman's father, Fred, the tapes are a devastating distraction. This is not now the Furman trial. This is a trial about the man that murdered my son. Judge Lancito has ruled that the jury will be able to hear portions of taped interviews with now retired LAPD detective Mark Furman. Furman says the N-word dozens of times on the tapes, but Judge Ito decides the jury will only hear two. The excerpts are brief, yet powerful and disturbing. They don't do anything. They don't do anything. After the excerpt ended, the, the, the Furman tapes, you broke down and cried at that moment. Why? Because I was worried at the ramifications, because I watched them with this look of horror and like disgust, you know, and watched them turn. I, I was like, this, that's it. I do. That's it. Furman had lied on the stand and had used an abhorrent racial slur. It throws a whole new light on defense assertions that he'd planted evidence, a charge he denies today, I only have one other but question. would not address at answer. the time. Uh, Detective Furman, did you plant or manufacture any evidence in this case? I assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. He refused to answer that question on the grounds it might tend to incriminate him. What more does anyone need? Furman is disgraced and dismissed from the case. Coming up. All right, Mr. Uh, Simpson, would you please stand and face the jury? The dramatic verdict. Late September, 1995, for nine long months, the trial of the century has been a national obsession. Stop domestic violence! Break the code of silence! But a casualty of the constant hype is the freedom of 14 men and women. The jury has been sequestered since before the trial started. We were told it was going to be about three months, and then when the third month came, and then it was four, and then five, and it kept going, it, ju it just went on and on and on. But, says David Aldana, there were bright spots, like several secret field trips. I actually got to fly the Goodyear blimp. We went to a Dodger game and I caught a, a foul ball. There was even a barbecue. One day that all my friends came to visit me and they all brought cases of beer and we got plastered. No, there are other companies. Back in court, O.J. Simpson cites the jurors' fatigue as one reason he's not going to testify. I'm mindful of the mood and the stamina of this jury. Jury, I have confidence, uh, a lot more it seems than Ms. Clark has, of their integrity, and, uh, that they will find, as the record stands now, that I did not, could not, and would not have committed this uh, crime. Four days later, the end right, is finally you. in sight. You have heard all the evidence. No more witnesses, no more delays. 
Just closing statements. First up, lead prosecutor Marsha Clark. Let me come back to Mark Furman for a minute, just so it's clear. Did he lie when he testified here in this courtroom saying that he did not use racial epithets in the last 10 years? Yes. Is he a racist? Yes. But the fact that Mark Furman is a racist and lied about it on the witness stand does not mean that we haven't proven the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. How in this country? Then comes defense attorney Barry Sheck. There's no doubt Furman's a liar and a genocidal racist. There's no doubt about that. But there's really no doubt either that they played with this sock is there. And if that can happen, that's a reasonable doubt for this case, period. End of sentence, end of case. Finishing for the defense, Johnny Cochran, with probably the most memorable quote of the trial. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. But now, two decades later, we learn that wasn't Cochran's phrase after all. He didn't invent that. That was done by the dean of the Santa Clara Law School, uh, Jerry Ullman, who was the most unknown person in our defense team. So 20 years later, he's getting the proper credit. He's getting the credit. He deserves it. However, regardless of their source, the words, it doesn't fit, hammer Cochran's message home. Do not use that word in And the after past. nine months of testimony, yes. hundreds of exhibits, more than 260 days isolated in a hotel, jurors are finally sent to determine O.J. Simpson's fate. We walked into that room. Um, well, let's see, what do you want to do first? Uh, well, let's just see where everybody stands. We went around the room, you know, guilty, not guilty. It's two votes guilty, 10 not guilty. After reviewing testimony, they prepare to vote again. Now, you guys had been sequestered for nine months. You mm -hmm. were tired. You hadn't seen your families, your kids, your friends. You wanted to get out of there. Were the majority of you working hard to get those two to come on board? Actually, no. Uh -uh. It wasn't arguing or yelling or, or anything like that. We just came to took another vote, and, and the other two came on board, and, and, and they said not guilty. And it wasn't because they thought that he was innocent. It was because the, the, the prosecution just didn't prove it. And Aldana, for one, also believed the defense argument that the police framed OJ. How is it that with all this evidence against OJ that he's set free? Um, some of that stuff was planted. And when some of it was planted, what was and what wasn't? How did Mark Furman play a part in your decision when it came down to the verdict? Uh, quite a bit, because everything that he had anything to do with pretty much got thrown out. I knew he was dirty. After, after a while, you, you get a sense of people. Do you truly believe that the police, the detectives, the criminologists were as incompetent as the defense had made him out to be. Yeah, I think so. Mr. Uh, Simpson, would you please stand and face the jury? Deliberations take less than four hours. We, the jury in the embattled title action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187. <laughs> they read it and we heard that and then I just fell apart. Fred and Kim Goldman were devastated. It was as if your insides got yanked out of you. Everything that we knew to be certain that he had killed Ron and Nicole, suddenly as if, oh, wait a minute, how is that possible? And then our side was in shock, and then you hear the cheers no and, the, and the jubilee. You're going on on the other side, Pep. Not that division became what was seen across the TVs for, for several days. It was 
blacks cheering, and whites crying. When you think of the verdict now, what are your thoughts? I feel betrayed. I feel really let down. I feel confused. Emotionally, I don't get why they chose to acquit him. Logically, I get it. It was because it was a, it was a racial thing. It was, you know, you're the, the messenger. And I'm sad. I'm sad that we as a country couldn't rise above. Above it. And, and make and a decision. And realize that two people were, were murdered, slaughtered, and that you do the right thing at that moment. Juror number 11 has to count two. Is this your verdict? All right! As for Simpson, he returns to his home in Brentwood, vowing to spend his time looking for the real killer. But first, he has a phone call to make to CNN. With us on the phone now is O.J. Simpson. Uh, how are you? I'm doing fine, and uh, one, I want to thank you. For, uh, could you believe that he called in? No, could not believe it. So he calls in, we put him on, actually, and Johnny Cochran's there, and he thanks Johnny for his help. Most of all, I want to thank that man, <laughs> Mr. Johnny Cochran, for believing from the beginning, listening, and putting his heart and soul on the line uh, to, to send me home. And he said, I'll, I'll come on soon and I'll, I'll tell you, the, I'll give you the whole story, Larry. Do you believe O.J. Simpson is innocent 20 years later? I found him innocent and I believe he's innocent. You still believe that 20 years later? Yep. With all your heart? All my heart. There's nothing, if I was given that same evidence again, I would find him not guilty again.